This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. But I want to move on now, Patrick, to our post-game chart book. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, that means you haven't registered your free account yet at MacroVoices.com. Just go to MacroVoices.com. Look for the red button on the homepage that says Looking for the Downloads. Patrick, here on page two of the post-game chart book, I see you've got a chart of the June crude oil contract. My favorite chart. What's on your mind? Eric, all I just wanted to show was on that June contract, uh, the the recovery that we've seen off of that $5 printed low. I can't even use the continuous contract because it's got that minus 40 print on it. And it's been quite a bit of a recovery. Certainly interesting to see uh, your thoughts as to what happens next here. So I wanted to start by asking you, though, to clarify something you've uh, said many times, that contango in the futures market is a proxy for and therefore a measure of the demand for storage in Cushing, Oklahoma. Now, Contango refers to a difference in price where the latter delivery month is priced higher than the near delivery month. What does that have to do with the demand for storage? Well, let's take a look at page three, which is showing you at a particular moment in time. This is as of yesterday's close on May 6th. Each one of those little yellow dots is showing you the price of each separate contract. So the bottom dot is the June contract. The next dot up is the July contract, August, September, October, and so forth, all the way out to 2029. The the crude oil futures literally trade 10 years worth of uh, future prices. We're really only looking at the front of the curve there. That difference in price, well, what does that have to do with storage? The easiest way to understand this is put yourself in the shoes of someone who owns physical crude oil that's in a tank in Cushing, Oklahoma, and their lease on that tank space is running out next month. They they can't keep the oil there because they don't have storage after sometime, say, a few weeks from now. What are they going to do? Well, they've got to call somebody and try to buy some more storage space. They also have another option, though, that's available to them. What they could do is they could sell the June delivery contract, that's the bottom dot, and buy back, let's say for sake of argument, the December contract, which is about $4 higher right now in price. That would basically allow them to take the oil that they have in storage, they would be essentially selling it and then buying it back later. But they would pay a fixed price that's guaranteed. They can lock in that price of $4. They're going to get their oil back, but now they've got four months to find someplace else to store it. So effectively, what they did by selling their oil and at the same time buying it back for later delivery was they secured an indirect form of storage for that oil for the next four months. Now, that's not the way that people who need to store oil actually conduct their affairs. They're much more likely to call a broker who handles these storage tanks and and leases and so forth and, and just directly rent some space from somebody who's got it. But because it's possible to do it that way, it creates an arbitrage where essentially the contango in the front of the WTI crude oil futures curve is a measure of the cost of storage, because one of the options for the way you could achieve storage of oil is selling your oil and buying it back, and the contango is effectively your storage cost. So that's what storage and contango have to do with one another. And the general rule of thumb is for the first six months or so of the WTI term structure, that's this uh, chart on page three, the first six dots or so, what the primary thing is that's going to be affecting the distance vertical space between those dots is the demand for storage. That's the primary thing that determines that spacing. And the reason we got into a super duper deep super contango where there was you know $5 of space between the dots last month is because 
because we literally were running completely and totally out of storage. Those dots are now much closer together than they were last month. That, at least on the surface, seems to be an indication that there's not nearly as much demand for storage as there was a month ago. Once you go past the first six dots or so, the rest of the curve really is more of a reflection of longer term expectations in the market for the balance between supply and demand. Okay, well, that covers the concept of what contango and backwardation means on any given day. But here's my problem with the chart on page three. It shows us all the different prices for all the different contracts as they were at one moment in time, as of yesterday's close, in this case, as of May 6th. But there was no actual time series in this in these charts. It doesn't show how this phenomenon of contango has been evolving throughout the entire crisis or over the past few months. Well, Patrick, that's exactly the reason that I very, very seldom use this form of chart. I wanted to start with this chart because this format is basically the industry standard. It's what everybody uses. And the way that most people would show a change in term structure is on the same chart. They'd have one you know, yellow line of dots like we see here. And then in another color, they would plot the term structure from a different date, from a different snapshot in time and say, OK, you know, the, the yellow line is yesterday and the green line is two weeks ago and the red line is a month ago. And we look at the difference in shape and maybe we can draw some conclusions from that. Even so, to me at least, this chart is just not a very effective way of thinking about what's going on. Because if I look, let's say, at the, the bottom of page three, look at those dots, the first dot to the second dot to the third dot. Well, is the the first dot farther from the second dot than the second dot is from the third dot? Or is that space between the third and the second dot bigger than the space of the first? And the, I can't tell. It's too hard just from looking at that chart. So I use my own form uh, of chart, and that's on page four. This particular format is kind of my own design. I haven't seen anybody else really think about term structure using this kind of chart. But what I'm doing is simply plotting each of those one month time spreads, the difference between each of those individual dots. And I'm plotting that as a time series. So the white line here that you see is the difference between the June and the July contract. The green line above it is the difference between the July and the August contract. The orange line above that is the difference between the August and September contract. The yellow one is September to October and so on and so forth. So by looking at it this way, what I can see is both the relative size of each of those one month spreads. I can see how they're trending and where there's a difference in trend. If you look at, say, going back to the beginning of April, you see a very distinct phenomenon here where there's a general breakdown in the time spreads moving lower. But for the most part, the orange one, which is uh, August, September, and the green one, which is July, August, they're kind of moving pretty much in the same direction following the, the same signals. But the white one, which is June, July, is moving on a completely different trajectory. It's falling at a much steeper pace. So you can see a lot more and you can intuit more from this chart, at least in my opinion, in terms of what's happening. Now, I should mention also that the particular chart that I have here is only showing the actively trading spreads, starting with the June to July spread. The, the one before that, which was the May-June spread, the reason I had to take that off the chart is it literally, as it went into expiration, just utterly collapsed all the way. You know, this the Y scale here only goes down to minus $8 at the very bottom right. That May-June spread went all the way to minus $60 at one point just before it expired. So it wouldn't even fit on the chart here, Patrick. Okay, well, this chart really drives the story home, but it seems to be completely at odds with a lot of what's been discussed here and predicted here on Macro Voices. For weeks and weeks, we've been discussing the, all the reasons uh, why we would run out of crude oil storage and why it, it would cause these time spreads to drop like a rock. And uh, we can clearly see that's exa exactly what was happening right up until April 21st when the pattern bottoms. But uh, since then, it's been an uphill ride for these time spreads. Uh, and the look at things, we've retraced almost all the way 
back to those uh, uh, mid-March levels. Now, Eric, please help me understand here. If anything, it seems like the chart is showing it's uh, pretty clear that the storage crisis is done and over with and having ended back on April 21st and uh, that there's no longer a shortage of crude oil storage in Cushing, Oklahoma. Or maybe am I reading something wrong? What uh, conclusions are you drawing from all of this? Well, you're not reading the chart wrong. The chart is exactly telling you that. It's basically saying, hey, the storage crisis is over, baby. The contango is coming out of the market. Seems like uh, something changed and everything is better now. And it is entirely plausible that that is an accurate explanation. Uh, I put out the feelers last week for our listeners in the physical crude oil market. I got several emails from people saying, hey, the the pace of shut-ins that's happened ever since that May contract debacle with the negative prices. That freaked everybody out. All the people that were on the fence, not really sure what to do, they went ahead and made their decisions to shut in. So we really are seeing en masse shut-ins of production that is dramatically reducing that demand for storage. So it is possible, I emphasize possible, that this could be it. It could be that, uh, you know, the price signal worked. It, it freaked everybody out. It caused the producers to shut in. And we no longer have a major contention for storage space in Cushing, Oklahoma, which certainly is what this chart appears to be telling us. Hold on. You just explained last week that you thought a smaller inventory builds in both Cushing and nationally were being misinterpreted. And that seems very relevant to this discussion. Now, please explain again and give us an update on whether you still think that's what's going on here. Well, what I predicted two weeks before it happened, back when we were getting 15 million barrels uh, of national builds and 5 million barrels of Cushing builds, I said, I think what's happening and I think what's coming is going to be a much smaller Cushing build, maybe even a Cushing drawdown. And everybody's going to assume it means, okay, there's no more demand for storage. The the storage crisis is behind us. In fact, it, it could mean that. It's possible that that's exactly what it does mean. But it's also possible that the reason, you know, think about a glass of water. If something is already full, you can't add more to it. If Cushing is as full as it can get and there's no room to put any more oil in because there's nobody who's willing to lease any spare storage capacity at any price, well, then the size of the builds have to get much smaller or even go to zero because there's no room to add any more. It doesn't mean that there's no demand. It just means that there's no room to add any more. Now, Patrick, my first thought was that phenomenon I predicted is in play. What we're seeing is smaller Cushing builds. The reason for the smaller Cushing builds is probably because there's no space left at all and oil cannot be added. It has to go into much more expensive floating storage instead, and the market's taking it the wrong way, and that has caused the beginning of a short squeeze because perhaps the the most crowded trade that there is in the oil market has been short time spreads. Lots and lots of big traders, short time spreads in size. They've had to start covering. It's caused a short covering rally or a short squeeze where everybody's being forced out. And I thought maybe that's based on a false signal. Well, the way you would validate that is to look at the tanker charter rates. If tanker charter rates are going through the roof, well, that means that, yeah, it's exactly what I thought. The reason for the smaller Cushing builds is because it all has to go into floating storage. It doesn't fit into Cushing, and the market's got the wrong signal. So let's go ahead and take a look at page five, which is showing spot tanker rates in the VLCC market, the very large crude carrier market. And I went and looked at this chart thinking, if this is going to a new high, That really confirms my thesis. Well, guess what? Not only is it not going to a new high, it's crashing back to levels not seen since February. And I thought, oh boy, if we're seeing the tanker market also reflecting a sudden drop in demand, maybe that means that we really and truly are past that peak in storage and we don't have demand for storage anymore was one of our listeners who pointed out to me on Twitter. He said, wait a minute, Eric, you're looking at the demand for spot storage of tankers. That's where 
the OPEC guys that are delivering oil from point A to point B, that's where they buy their tankers. But the tanker trade, the contango trade, where you're storing oil by chartering a tanker for six or 12 months to just sit at anchor and, and hang on to the oil and come back and deliver it later, that's a different market. That's the time charter market. That's a different chart. And that one is on page six. So all of a sudden we see on page six, wait a minute. That number's coming down. Well, first of all, why did the number on page five come down? The reason it came down is because OPEC's production cuts went into effect May 1st. That means OPEC countries are using less of those delivery tankers to deliver oil. Those prices are coming down. Well, if those prices are coming down, that means there's more tankers in the ocean that are available to, to be hired for something. It only makes sense that that has to cause the time charter market to come down too. Did it come down just as much or not quite as much? Well, it really, if you look at page six here, it didn't come down nearly as much. So I'm kind of on the fence here, Patrick. I, I think there is still room for the interpretation that what has happened here is there's been a short squeeze in time spreads that has pushed both the time spreads and the flat month price higher. It's being driven by this perception that we don't really have a storage problem anymore, that, we, that the demand for floating storage is collapsing, which if you looked at the first chart on page five showing tanker rates, you'd come to that conclusion. If you look at the page six chart, though, which I want to thank that listener for pointing this out to me, it really tells a very different story. So I think the jury is still out here. There's definitely room to conclude that what's going on is we've seen a short squeeze in both front month price and in time spreads. May have topped today, just as I look at the chart as we're speaking on Thursday afternoon. It looks like a reversal may be upon us in both the flat price of the June contract and in time spreads. But hey, this is, uh, you know, we're at the point in this crisis in the beginning. I was super high conviction. I'm like, folks, I know exactly what's going to happen. I'm sure of it. Well, we're at the hard part now where it's, you know, I see a couple of scenarios. I think you could interpret this either way. But my base case, if I have to say what I think is most likely, I think this thing's overdone. I think at least part of this has been a short squeeze. Maybe we do have less demand. We're past the peak for demand and storage because there's been so many shut-ins of production. Very, very possible. We've got lots of evidence to corroborate that that is going on. But is the demand for storage really almost gone completely away as the, the chart on page four seems to imply? No, I don't think so. I think what's happened is some of it's gone away. It started a short squeeze. That short squeeze has had to play out, may have topped out today. And it remains to be seen, Patrick, how this ultimately plays out. So Eric, it remains to be seen how this uh, all plays out here. But what are the signposts? What are we looking for and how this all gets resolved? Well, for that, we need to go back to page four in the slide deck. Now, you mentioned earlier, you said that it looks like the storage crisis appears from this chart to have ended on the 21st of April. Actually, if you look a little more closely at the graph on page four, you'll see that it's the June-July contract, the white line that bottoms on the 21st of April. But really, all the other later spreads, the green one is July, August, and the orange is August, September, and so forth. They all bottomed on the 28th, not the 21st. So what's special about the 21st? That's the question you have to ask. Why did the June, July spread go so far down on the 21st? And furthermore, look at how steep it declined into the 21st. It was really only in those last few days from the 16th of April to the 21st that it just took an absolute nosedive. I mean, it was on a downward trajectory before, but it was kind of in line with, with what the spreads above it were doing. And then on the 16th, it just took an outright nosedive. Now, this chart doesn't even do justice to how big of a nosedive that was, Patrick, because intraday on the 21st, this spread actually traded all the way down to minus $12. It would be well off the bottom of the scale here. Uh, this chart is only showing closing prices on the end of each day. So it just shows you uh, minus 710 or so, which is where that spread closed on the 21st. But it was in absolute freefall. What's so special 
about those dates, the 16th of April and the 21st of April. It's no coincidence, Patrick. The 16th of April was options expiration for the May contract, the one that came before this one, and the 21st was the last trading day for the May contract. So what happened is when, and and we don't have it on this particular chart, but the May-June spread, it didn't just dive down to minus 12. It dove all the way down between the 16th and the 21st. It dove all the way down to minus 60. So why did that happen? The answer is, you know, you can play lots of games with sentiment and, and maybe gaming the inventory numbers a little bit. It's been suggested that some of the big players may have been leasing storage in Cushing and intentionally leaving it empty to make sure that Cushing never hit the actual full mark as far as the EIA reporting was concerned, trying to kind of confuse the market a little bit and and muster some positive sentiment that might not actually have been warranted by the true underlying conditions. But the thing is, when you get to the contract going into expiry from options expiration to the actual final trading date, that's when the fat lady sings, so to speak. That's when you find out whether or not there's an imbalance between the number of physical shorts that are standing for delivery, that are going to actually deliver oil as opposed to rolling their paper contracts forward versus the number of physical longs, people who are able to actually receive delivery as opposed to paper traders who have to roll out of that position. That's when the fireworks really start. And that's when you can't really hide reality from the market. So, The answer is, I don't know. It could be that the storage crisis really is mostly behind us. I'm very, very skeptical of that. I find it very hard to believe. If I'm right, it would be into options expiration, which is next Thursday, the 14th of May, would be when the fireworks start. And by the 18th or 19th of May, the 19th Tuesday is the last trade date for the June contract. The uh, 18th, Monday, is called the penultimate day, which is a great big Latin word that means the second to last one. Uh, Why they they use that fancy word, I don't know, but that's what they call it. The second to last trading day is usually where everybody has to get out of the market because the last day is really only for the the physical traders to finalize their their transactions. So by the end of the 18th, we're going to know one way or the other. If on the 18th, we, we see basically the backwardation on the June-July spread, which on this chart is showing one spot 24. Uh, Let's say it's still less than $2 as of Monday the 18th. Uh, Okay, look, folks, uh, I guess I was a little bit late on the call. The storage crisis, it's behind us. It's getting better. It's time to start thinking about how you play the upside of the oil market from here. I think it's more likely that we're going to see some more downside before we get to the 18th, maybe a lot more downside. But really, we don't find out until we get past OPEX, which is next Thursday. And needless to say, we'll have another update for our listeners on next week's Macro Voices, which we'll be recording just a few minutes after the pit close on the OPEX day. Until then, it sounds like the message is to watch for a possible downside reversal and maybe a big one on both time spreads and the front month price. Is that the gist of it? Exactly. And again, I am hearing feedback from some of our listeners in the physical market saying, hey, the rate of shut-ins is just scary. It could be that this is this is real. The demand for storage has abated significantly because a whole bunch of people were forced to shut in. It could be as simple as that. Uh, I have a really hard time believing that the storage crisis is over already, despite what these charts are telling us. And, you know, we'll find out. Certainly by the end of the month, that will be it. In the interest of full disclosure, I just want to mention I have exited most of my time spread shorts last Thursday and Friday, as I described on last week's podcast. Even though I I didn't think the move made sense, I thought it was set to continue. I was right about that. I was fortunate to get out of the way. I did put some of those time spread shorts back on today, thinking maybe this is the top today of a short squeeze. But that's a much smaller position, much less leverage than I was using before, because I'm really not sure of it this time, where I was pretty darn sure the last time around. So we'll see what happens. Overall, though, uh, I don't know if it's time yet for us to start thinking about 
buying the bottom of this market and you know how to play the recovery from here maybe there's one more push down but you know if it's one more push down pretty soon if we haven't already seen the bottom we're going to get to a bottom and it's going to be time to look at how you buy the bottom of this market and i don't think it's with uso or uh, or any of the other etf products which are very vulnerable to the contango at the front end of the curve the the way to play that is with time spreads further out on the back end of the curve. Let's save that conversation until we get there, until we think that we're actually past that point. It could be as early as next week's episode. We'll see. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.